So I just want to, first of all, say good evening. My name is Maritza Kayaga, and I'm the proud executive director for Maine RISD. And welcome to our virtual budget informational session. This is an important topic for our community. Our budget impacts everything that we can do as a school district, including the resources and programs that we can provide our scholars and our ability to addressing the needs and proposing pay increases for our staff. Maine RISD, along with many, many including all other school districts across Central Texas are in the middle of this crucial planning process, and there are considerations and factors that impact its overall development. And tonight we'll share some of that information with you and give you the opportunity to ask some questions. So I'd like to again thank you here for being uh, thank you for being here again to take time of your schedules to tune in this evening, um, including in this crazy crazy weather that we're having. And I also want to thank Dr. Our Superintendent Dr. Robert Sarmani for being here tonight. He'll be sharing some insight into our ASL interpreters as well. I'm still seeing a few more people trickle in. So while we wait for them to trickle, um, I'm gonna share some information on what tonight's virtual session is going to look like. To start, Dr. Sarmani is gonna share some information related to the budget and how it impacts our district. From there, we'll take questions from the audience. For our audience members who are here with us today, please use the Q&A feature. I believe it's at the bottom right um, to submit your question related to the budget process or our financial future. We will go ahead and um, take as many questions as we can from our audience tonight, but we also have some that were submitted from community members earlier um, or prior to tonight's event. Um, again, we'll go through as many questions as we can, but if we don't get to yours this evening, we still have an opportunity for you to get your answers. Please email info at mainrisd.net to submit your questions. And for those who are unable to attend tonight or would like to watch this session again, a recording of this meeting will be available on our YouTube channel and we place on our social media pages in the coming days. Uh, now to kick it off, I'm going to go ahead and toss it over to Dr. Sermani. Oh, thank you very much, Marita, and uh, thank you for being here tonight to help uh, set all this up. Um, thank you all, everyone out there in uh, virtual world uh, who tuned in for a budget session. Uh, sometimes this isn't the most exciting topic, but it's an incredibly impactful topic, not only to our school district, but to the community in general. So we'll go through some information. Um, hopefully I can uh, make it lively and um, help uh, you understand how school finance works. Uh, certainly, if as I go along, if some things aren't clear, uh, just like uh, Ms. Gallagher said, please uh, put some questions in the question function. And if we don't answer them tonight, or I don't know the answer to that question, we will get to them in the future and post them in a frequently asked questions. So uh, let's just dive right in. Um, so virtual budget information session. Uh, we're going to start off with some budget basics. Some of you out there may already know this, but some of you may not. There are actually three budgets in a school district. You can see here, one is the maintenance and operations, one is the interest in sinking, and one is school nutrition. I'm actually gonna start with the bottom. School nutrition is exactly what you think it is. It's the cafeteria, um, and that's the money that comes in when students pay for lunches, or if they're on free and reduced lunch, the federal government reimburses us for that cost. It can only be used for school nutrition and nothing else. Uh, going up from that, you see interest in sinking. And that's kind of like um, your mortgage payments. So whenever school districts take on debt uh, to build buildings, for example, they take on the debt. And when you bring in tax dollars, it is the interest in sinking fund that pays back that debt. And the final one is the maintenance and operation. And that's your, your salaries, your utilities, everything you need to run a school district. As you can see the note there, 90% of the revenues we generate in the maintenance and operations side of the tax rate goes to salaries. And that, that's not abnormal in school districts. Most school districts uh, are up above 80, 85% of their revenues going to uh, salary. One thing I wanna point out about this, by law, none of the money between these three funds can mix. So sometimes I get asked, you know, when you're building a building, why don't you just take that money and make raises out of it? You're le legally not able to do that. Money that comes in for bonds or for interest in sinking must stay in that um, pot of money. So you go forward, Ms. Gallagher. So uh, some information about the maintenance and operation budget, since that's the one that most people really think about when we talk about designing and building a budget. Uh, this is a list of factors that affect those budgets, and I'm going to mention each one and how that affects budgets. The first one, of course, is the state legislature. You know, they have the right um, to change how the finance system works, but they also sometimes in the middle of the legislative session will add a cost to the district that we weren't prepared for. 
So sometimes I talk to business people and they say, well, why, why can't you arrange your budget so that you know what's coming? Well, we don't know what's coming. For example, this past legislative session in September, we had got a $1.3 million add to the budget that was unfunded. And so, of course, we had to find a way to fund it because there's you can't just tell the legislature, no, you have to go ahead and, and do what the law requires of us. Uh, the second major factor affecting uh, the budget, of course, is property value and tax rate. Uh, the higher the property values go up, uh, the more revenue that comes in. The higher the tax rate goes up, the more revenue comes in to a point. And I say to a point because there is something called recapture in the state of Texas. Once your property values get to be a certain amount and compared to the number of students you have in the district, your tax rate no longer increases the amount of value you get from your property value. So oftentimes uh, people ask me, well, the property value is going up. You're getting plenty of money from that, right? Well, actually, no. Um, at a certain point, the state comes in and takes that local money and puts it right back into the state treasurer. Uh, right now, we are estimating about 1.7 million we are going to send to the state of Texas uh, this uh, next budget year. Whoops, we lost it. I saw that's her. So while Ms. Gallagher is putting that back up there, the next one on the list was enrollment in ADA. So we do get, um, if you go backwards, Ms. Gallagher, we get uh, funding per student, and that's across the state. We'll talk about that one in a second. And we also get funded by the amount of days each student attends on average. And that's what ADA stands for, average daily attendance. Inflation, huge driver of cost these days. And we can talk about that in a moment. But another driver of cost that you may have noticed, for those of you who have gone out looking for homeowners insurance recently, uh, insurance for buildings has gone up tremendously in the state of Texas and school districts are no different. Uh, you see ESSER funds. Those are the funds that the federal government gave school districts to combat COVID uh, learning loss. Uh, those funds are coming to an end this year. And of course, employee compensation, as I mentioned earlier, is 90% of our budget or revenues, I should say. So the maintenance and operation, uh, a couple of things here. Uh, so first of all, some notes on just some inflation. You can, you can read what we have up there, but the one that you hear me quote most often is our own Texas State Comptroller said that our costs have increased 19% in school districts since the year 2019. Um, again, in talking to a businessman recently, he was talking about this and I said, you know, I've got the same issues you do, that when my, my cost to do things goes up, um, I, I, I have to spend more to maintain the services I have. But unlike a business, I can't pass on costs necessarily to consumers because these are children I'm teaching and they need to be taught. The other point I'd like to point out here is if you saw, see the basic allotment, uh, the basic allotment hasn't changed in quite a while. Those two bold um, printed ones of 6250, those were proposed by the legislature. They did not pass, but you can see the small amount that they were talking about increasing the basic allotment. So the basic allotment is the dollar amount we get per student. Currently that's $6,160 per student. Um, of course, it costs roughly uh, 10 to $12,000 on average to educate a student in the state of Texas. You go forward. So here we just have some graphic representations of what we're facing in budgets. And again, uh, like Ms. Gallagher said, this is not an unusual situation in the state of Texas right now. Districts all across the state of Texas are in different places uh, attempting to deal with these budget shortfalls. And so this is uh, the blue line you see there is our actual revenues. The yellow line are actual expenditures and the green line are future um, revenue uh, projections. Now you'll see a spike there at 22-23, and there's a few things going on there. In 22-23, uh, you may recall there was Ice Storm Uri, and states, uh, the state gave districts the opportunity to bring in some revenue in order to combat some of the damage. The other thing you see there is an increase in, in expenditures. That wasn't a, a spending spree uh, necessarily. Part of what you see there is the post-pandemic inflation began to run rapid. Many of us remember when gas was a little bit cheaper than it is now. Uh, what also happened is um, post-pandemic, many of our educators remember there were a lot of vacancies in the district and all districts. Well, right around 2023, people began to come back into the workforce and school districts. So suddenly those payroll began to hit 
the budget and the expenditures at that time. So you see there's a whole confluence of events happening that's increasing the expenditures right about that time. The disaster money that came in helped pay for those expenditures, but that was a one-year thing, and now our revenues have dropped, and we've got to drop expenditures along with it. Move forward. If you can move forward. So this is our, our fund balance. Um, you'll see the blue line is the actuals, and the yellowish line is our plan to be able to maintain the fund balance as best we can as we move forward. Uh, the reason I put this slide up there is uh, I get asked sometimes, you, you have a savings account of over $40 million. Why can't we use that to cover the budget? And we are, actually. Uh, because trustees did such a great job in the past of maintaining the fund balance, we we're able to uh, spread out the cuts that we're doing over time. And that also gives us buys us some time to hope the state legislator gives us um, new funding to help catch up with inflation. So and that's why you see that prediction. You know, we're going to fall down rapidly and then we'll go back up. And please note that the bottom line down there is not zero. We are not getting to zero or anywhere near zero fund balance. And so I want to point that out. That's still uh, 15, 17, 18 million dollars down there at its lowest point. You go forward one. So getting to the budget and what we actually do when we try to build uh, the budget. Uh, we have some guiding principles. Uh, part of these guiding principles are driven um, by uh, leadership telling me what they have prioritized. And we also survey, we have over 500 staff members in the district who responded to our survey and prioritized things. Uh, their top priorities or the top two priorities were uh, staff compensation and number two, keeping class sizes as uh, low as we possibly can. So this, these guiding principles in the budget we were creating are reflected of that. So you can see that they're um, retaining our staff. That helps us with uh, filling the vacancies and ensuring that all our students have a, a teacher and also involves compensation. We also want to protect the progress we've been making with our students in college and career readiness, literacy and math. Providing classroom teachers, we are growing at almost 6% now. That's a lot of students coming in and they need teachers or we, we would have to increase class sizes. And then of course, we, I mentioned earlier, we are spreading the reductions that we're doing over time. So our proposed plan, uh, what I try to tell people is what we're planning on doing right now is gonna do three things. So increase staff salaries, uh, decrease taxes and pay for safety, security, and mental health supports. So if you walk away with anything, this is what we're trying to accomplish with our, our budget plan in the next year. So first, the compensation plan. So some of this, if you tuned in in some of our, our board meetings, these slides I've really just pulled off of some of our board meetings so that uh, I can reiterate some of this information tonight. Uh, I'm proposing on May 21st that the, the trustees offer a guaranteed 1% increase in staff compensation across the board. That's all staff, um, not just teachers. Some teachers were asking if that was just for teachers. It's not. It's for everybody. We're also considering a tax rate election, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means, though. But if we have the tax rate election, then we'll also be able to afford an increase of additional 2%. So in total, if the VA... We call it Vader. If the Vader is approved, the total salary increase would be 3% from the midpoint. So, and that re increase would be retroactive to the start of the 24 25 contract year. Uh, of course, elections don't happen until November. So, the tax rate plan. So, here's where we're going to get into the, the nitty gritty numbers uh, for those of you who, who really want to get into the numbers. So, what you have here is um, a little bit of a history of the tax rate. And it kind of gives you an idea of what the tax rate is. The last column is the total tax rate. Um, it, I'm going to go from left to right on the columns just so you understand what they are. Of course, you have a property tax here. The MCR is called the maximum compressed rate. The state of Texas uh, requires a tax rate to go down. And what they do is they send school districts more money to make us even. So it's not increasing or decreasing the revenues when they do the MCR and push the tax rate down, they make it even. Uh, the pennies are what are known, they're known as golden pennies. And what that means is these are pennies of tax that generate revenue that cannot be recaptured by the state. So these go golden pennies, so-called, are wealth that stays within the community. You have the maintenance and operation tax rate. 
you have the INS tax rate. Remember, maintenance operation is salaries, utilities, insurance. And then you have the INS tax rate. That is funding bonds and paying down debt. And then, of course, on the far right, you have your total tax rate. You go forward. So last but not least, um, and I, what's really funny right now is my video is covering up the very end of the tax rate there. So I can't see exactly what it says, but I know it by memory a little bit. Um, so the property tax rate, uh, what we're after, you can see uh, from 2023 to 2024 proposed, it'll drop down roughly about 0.5 cents. And that's really a half a cent. So in what we're proposing and then the tax rates we're proposing be adopted by the trustees and if they so choose, you will see an overall drop in the tax rate. Move forward. Now in that process, uh, a tax rate election is assumed would be passed. That tax rate election will add three of the golden pennies, and that'll be roughly 4.8 million in revenue. And of course, that's just an estimate at this point. So what do you get with 4.8 million? Um, you get a 3% tax raise, I'm sorry, 3% um, salary raise for all staff. Your overall tax rate goes down by half a cent. And then we're gonna use the rest of that money to pay for some of the requirements from House Bill 3 in the last legislative session uh, for police officers and their equipment, and then also to provide some mental health supports uh, for our students and for our staff. And this is a nice little graphic we've been working on. Shows you if the Vader is approved, you get these things and you get lower tax with it. So last but not least, I'm going to get into the actual budget numbers that we're proposing uh, coming up for the 24-25 school year. And these budget numbers, by the way, assume uh, a successful Vader. Um, you, obviously, if a Vader doesn't pass, we will have to pull out the items that are related to the Vader in order to, to realize the same numbers. You can see the revenues on the side. Uh, you see local revenue. That's the tax money that comes in. You have the state aid. That's the money the state sends us. And then there is some federal money that comes in. For those of you out there familiar with title money, that's what that is. So on the other side, you see the expenditures. Uh, you see our last year's budget at $119 million worth of expenditures. Uh, we use that kind of as a baseline just to get us started at this point in the budgeting process. When we get to June, we'll have actual numbers for next year. You see the 3% salary increase, uh, about $2.6 million. I'll explain what those additional costs are, but the majority of that is the expiring federal funds from ESSER that have been used to pay for teacher salaries in the past. And then the, the savings that we've attempted um, to find within the budget at $7.1 million. Then you also see the recapture, uh, the $1.7 million we are believing that we're going to, estimating that we're going to need to send back to the state. So you can see the adopted deficit back in 23-24 was at 23 million. The projected deficit this time around is 17 Point nine million right now. That number, I hope to get it down even lower by the time we get to June uh, to adopt the budget. I want to make one note on the difference between an adopted and a realized budget. When, when I do the budgeting um, and when we adopt a budget, the school board trustees are putting a ceiling. We will not exceed these numbers. And so what that doesn't account for is when we have vacant positions and in an organization with 1,300 employees, there's inevitable we'll have a vacant position somewhere where we're not paying a salary. So those numbers will always be lower than what we adopted. And I think that's just important to be transparent that I'm trying to make sure that I'm painting out there a very conservative worst case spending scenario that we will never exceed. We will only save money from there. So if you go forward, Ms. Gaga. So here we have some of the additional costs, what I, what I include in the additional costs, what I included in those savings. You'll notice the $3.3 million in teaching positions that were being federally funded with COVID funds. Those funds are ending and they need to be moved into uh, our regular um, tax dollar on revenue. And then you can see some of the savings uh, that we've identified that are um, in that savings number of $7.1 million. Okay, just a bit of a timeline. Um, May 21st, we are planning on bringing forward to the trustees the uh, approval of general raises. June 17th at the regular board meeting, we hope to approve a budget and a compensation plan. And August 19th, uh, we will be discussing a possible tax rate election and possibly setting the tax rate at that time if trustees so choose.
And that would be the end of, of the presentation part. Okay, awesome. So now we're going to get to our question, our, our question and answer portion of the evening. Um, and so we're going to take some. So if you have a question, please put in the Q and A. Um, should be down to your right. And then we're also going to get to some questions that were submitted earlier through our questionnaire form. Um, so we'll go ahead and kick off the evening with a question from our form. And our first question is: Will we be able to keep the classroom size to twenty two one? How will the budget be developed to prioritize this classroom size or smaller classroom sizes? And, and I, I guess you, you probably heard and one of the things the high priority for our, our staff has been to maintain as low a, a class size as possible. And really the most important aspect of that is ensuring that we retain and recruit teachers to not only teach the new students coming in, but still filling those vacancies that is still kind of held over um, some since the pandemic, which we have been doing a, doing a fabulous job. And that really is hats off to the principals and to the teachers who are really embracing their new colleagues and wanting them to stay within the district. Um, I can't ever guarantee that we're always going to be at 22 to 1. It is always something that we will strive to to be at K through fourth grade. Uh, we strive to be at 25 to 1 on average at the middle school and no bigger than 28 to 1 at the high school level. Uh, there are times when that that's not possible. There's also times when that's not even desirable, depending upon the class. But the pathway to that is to ensure that we continue to save enough money that we can continue to hire teachers. There are districts in the state that have gotten themselves so far in, in the deficit that they're even struggling to hire teachers now because they just can't afford it. And we want to try to avoid that at all costs. Thank you. Our next question is, has the district conducted any feasibility studies or pilot programs to evaluate the potential benefits and challenges of a four day work week for both teachers and students? Not a feasibility study so much. I've done a lot of my own personal looking into it and reading the research. Um, here, here's the quick of it. Uh, a four day work week, it, it does save you a little bit of money. It does. Uh, my concern about it are twofold about a four day work week. And by the way, I would love to have a, a four day work week. It would work great for me. Uh, but I, I have a hard time supporting it because every major, there's been two major studies nationwide of a four day work week. And both of them concluded that student achievement actually dropped after the implementation of a four day work week. And, and we're in the business of teaching children. And it, it's hard for me to, to get behind something that's going to decrease student achievement. The other issue that I worry about is in, in our neighborhood, do we have enough child care available for families if we're not um, teaching on Fridays? And that's that's a concern because there's already issues with enough available and affordable child care in the Austin area as it is. Thank you. Our next question is, where does the federal Title III money that the bilingual department um, receives go to? In the past, they would host community sessions. Is that still taking place? If not, why? So Title III money, uh, for those of you who don't know, there's federal money that comes uh, for students who are known as emergent bilinguals. These are students who uh, speak another language. Uh, English is a second language for them. And so those federal dollars, they come and they're attached to a number of rules to them and how they're able to be spent. Uh, the Title III budget right now, and, and this isn't a new thing, the majority of that money goes to paying for payroll for staff members that are supporting campuses and teachers. These are the staff members that help principals with uh, what's known as LPAC, um, with the, the, the documentation that is required by the state and federal government with the emergent bilinguals. And so those staff are key in ensuring that paperwork or as little of it as we can gets put on to our bilingual teachers who are teaching the kiddos. Uh, I do know that there is money um, spent on community projects. There was $12,000 um, spent this year. I do not know off the top of my head what that money was spent on. I just know it was spent on something having to do with community events. And that's certainly something we can get details on um, at a different time. Our next question, um was submitted prior to the event. And are cuts being made to academics? If so, are we cutting from athletics programming and fine arts programming too? You, you know, trying to say that the cuts are being made to academics, is, it's tough for me to even answer that question. Uh, there are cuts being made all over the place um, in a way to try to not only um, protect classrooms so that we can continue to improve upon our student achievement, um, but it's inevitable when 90% of your 
your revenue is going towards payroll that we're going to have to touch something that at least indirectly touches academics. And there have been central office positions, for example, that we've had to uh, repurpose or eliminate. We've also have uh, instructional coaching positions that we've reduced down to one on every single campus and to get us in line with the average uh, for other districts. Um, but uh, to answer the other part of the question, uh, everybody is, is working to reduce their budget, whether it's athletics, fine arts, uh, whether it's um, central office facilities, utility costs, uh, you name it. At this point, we're all looking for savings in every aspect of the work we do. Now, some people's budgets are bigger than others, so they have more to lose. And you'd be surprised, the facilities and maintenance budget is one of the largest budgets in the district, so they have more to cut than, say, a fine arts or an athletics budget, which is actually much smaller um, in size. So yes, everybody is, is trying to work together as a team to try to find the savings to ensure we have enough teachers in the classroom and we can afford these compensation plans. Um, and our next question, is there any opportunity to reduce costs by reducing um, transportation or bus transportation between the three high schools? Uh, I, I, I am open to ideas. I, I, the only idea is, <laughs> I would love to end the busing between between the high schools, but uh, what what uh, what I have to explain to you, if you don't understand how high schools work, let me explain a little bit and why we can't get out of that busing right now. At least I haven't figured out a way yet, and believe me, I've been trying. Um, usually, um, when you have ninth graders self-contained, you can actually kind of self-contain them. But once you have 10th graders on a campus, which is what we have, 9, 10 students at Maynard High School and 11, 12 at the senior high school, and then you have MEX, you inevitably have to bus the kids because of the types of courses they take. The only way to avoid the busing would be a massive increase in staffing to self-contain both sides. But if you do that, of course, what did you just do? You just added a million dollars onto your budget, which becomes self-defeating. Uh, the real answer to that question is, is eventually we're going to have to make a decision whether we want to move the 10th grade over to the senior high school. But to do that, we would need more physical space. There's not enough space to contain that many more students over there. But I like what you're thinking. And so if you come up with some other ideas, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. Uh, next question is, what grants and other federal, federal funding opportunities has the district applied for? Uh, there are a lot of different grant opportunities that are out there, and we're a participant in, in quite a few of them. Um, and I, I can probably get the dollar number. I actually recently found that dollar amount or number and just counted it all up. I, I don't want to try to guess off the top of my head because it's been been a while since I came up with that number. Uh, but there are, there are millions of dollars in grants that we apply to and get. Um, I do want to point out, though, a lot of people talk about, well, you can use grants to pay for that, grants to pay for that. There's a problem with grants, some grants. A lot of grants come with with strings attached that require you to spend it in certain ways that maybe not necessarily directly impact the classroom where you might be after. So we are very much looking at grants that pay for something we know we already have to have and we need to free up money that I can take to continue to support the teachers in the classroom and the campus staff. So that's the kind of grant we're looking at. Um, I will tell you, though, people in the grant world will tell you a lot of grants have been drying up as well over time, post-COVID. Uh, that just seems to be a trend there. Thank you. Our next question is, who is, uh, who is tracking all of the cuts we are making as a school district so that when the, the legislator finally decides to provide the funding we need, we know what to cut and we know what we need back? Yes. Uh, you know, and you really hit on... The, the whole reason why you want to spread out the cuts over time. Uh, the, the one thing I, I really don't want to do is cut something and just turn around and bring it right back two years from now, because that can be very disruptive to the program and we could have just tried to weather the storm and try to bring it through. So we try to identify um, efficiencies that we can keep for good and so that we can, those are good efficiencies that we can focus on others. And then anything else that we had to cut that we don't want to cut, yes, we have a very long running list of those things that are kept in the finance department um, that we have a record of, um, all those savings. Next is, has the district considered implementing regular cost of living adjustments, COLA in parentheses, for teachers to ensure that salaries keep pace with inflation and the rising cost of living? 
You know, it's interesting that actually very thought was was proposed in the last legislative session to legislatures and everybody thought it was a great idea. And then they saw how much it was going to cost them and they just tossed it aside. Uh, the reality is I, I love the idea. I think that would be a great way to for the state to fund schools. You take the basic allotment, you add inflation and cost of living to it, and that's how much money we're given each year. And then we can pass that on to our employees. But the reality is, as a district alone, without state aid, there is absolutely no way that any district can afford um, to be able to do that. Uh, we would bankrupt the district. And unfortunately, it is a true thing that school districts go bankrupt, and it is not a good, a good situation when that happens. And it has happened around the state, unfortunately. Uh, our next question is, have, has Maine ISD applied for the teacher incentive allotment? If not, why not? And if we have, have we implemented it? Uh, yes, uh, Mayor ISD has, and it. Uh, I don't know when Mayor ISD first implemented it. It was as prior to my arrival here a year ago. Uh, the, the issue is that when you apply for the teacher incentive allotment, you have to be um, awarded it by the state. And we got a notice in, fe in not February, in April, that we were not going to be awarded it this year. So it automatically bumps us into the next year's cycle. So once again, um, we're going to submit all the information again in the fall. We find out in the spring whether we made it in. And if we do, then we can implement for the 25-26 school year. Uh, I will say that I think the teacher incentive allotment is something that we really want to put some, some attention to. Um, and I have actually assigned a staff person whose job is going to be, one of their functions is going to be, is to help carry us through that process. Um, although one strange thing about the TIA, and this is always hurts my head to think about this, um, they tell you you didn't make it at the end of the school year, which means you use the data that you've been having all year for the next year, but you don't have a chance to change anything in what you were attempting to do, if that makes sense. So they tell us in, in, in April you didn't make it, but you only have one month less than the school year. And the 23, 24 data is what you have to submit in the fall. So you really, if, if things didn't go well this year again, um, you didn't find out about it till April and you have no chance to fix it. And we have to fix it for the next year moving forward. Dr. Sermani, this, this isn't a question, but I think it would be helpful. Can you talk a little about what the teacher incentive allotment is for those who may sure. not know? So, so this is something that the, the state legislature set up and began funding. And the idea behind it is, is essentially to identify high quality teachers and provide extra funding for them and more salary. Uh, so uh, I'll give you an example for um, a teacher, we'll just say a fourth grade teacher who's teaching reading language arts. If they demonstrate students growing at an above average rate, um, if you're in TIA, you can identify that, that teacher within the program standards They'll get a, a, a marker on their certificate and with them comes money that goes directly to them. And it can be anywhere from three to $12,000. Last time I looked would go directly to that teacher. Thank you. Um, next question is, will communities, uh, communities in schools be impacted as a result of the budget? Yes, uh, recently, uh, or I shouldn't say recently, but in past years, uh, we used to have a grant called the Office of the Governor Grant that provided about $750,000, um, which helped fund CIS within the school district. Unfortunately, they reduced the amount of awards in that grant to a very small sum, and we got none of the money. Uh, so we had a hole in our budget of $750,000. And so we worked out with CIS to reduce their footprint so that the cost would be less because uh, we really needed that money to focus in on teachers and on supporting the compensation plan. Um, we also have a plan to, and I'll let you notice in the TRE about social, um, social emotional supports for students and uh, mental supports for students. That's actually part of the plan in the TRE is to hire some LSWs, uh, licensed social workers, um, clinical um, persons that can provide some of the services that CIS would provide because um, our kids need it. And so we're going to go forward and try to hire those persons as well um, to um, augment those services again or replace the gap that's being left by the changeover with CIS. 
our next question is, does the budget support full, uh, support fully the staff needed in the special ed department, specifically aids, resource teachers, and intervention teachers. Can, can you ask the first part of the question again? I missed it. So no problem. I'm happy to repeat it. Does the budget fully support or excuse me, does the budget support fully the staff needed in the special ed department, specifically aids, resource teachers, and intervention teachers? Yes. Uh, the the budget does support them fully. Um, I will say this, um, I don't know that we were, we were paying special educators in some fields enough, and that's something that we continue to look at, and I wish the legislature would step up, and quite frankly, the federal government would fully fund um, special education law and provide um, those salaries that those persons deserve. Uh, but certainly, all those positions that are needed in, are in the budget. None of them were touched. In fact, we didn't touch classroom teacher positions either. So I fully expect to, to hire those um, as they come, as we find those individuals. And speaking of special education, um, are the budget cuts um, going to impact special education and the resources provided? Uh, no, they're not. Um, we, we provide the services to the students that they need. Um, and that's not just a, that's not just a legal obligation. That's a moral obligation as well. Um, now, um, what, what budget cuts do hinder, and it's not on the special ed side, it hinders our ability to provide compensation and provide raises in the future, which if you're a special education proponent, a great opportunity to write your legislatures and your federal um, politicians to help ask for that support. But no, we're, we're not impacting the instructional arrangements for, for the kiddos. And I know this question was, I think you answered it in your presentation, but I know people are tuning in and out and we had it on the Q&A, so I want to ask it again. It's, if my property taxes are going up, doesn't it mean that schools should get more money? It seems that way. It does. And, and don't forget, I, I own a house in, in, in Manor ISD too. And so I see the tax bill and it seems that way that it should work that way, sort of. Um, so you, you have two different tax rates. You may recall from earlier, you have the interest in sinking. That is the tax rate that funds uh, building, um, debt, and bond. Think of that as your mortgage payment, for example. So as property values go up, yes, that one does bring in more money, but it can only be used for um, supporting um, debt and for paying down the debt. That's all it can be used for. Then you have your maintenance and operation tax rate. Yes, as, as property values go up, um, more money comes in, but at a certain point, the state says, whoa, you're getting way too much money. We're gonna take some of that. And so they do, and they put it back in the state coffers. Now, some of you may wonder, well, why does the state do that? Ostensibly, they're supposed to be taking that money and delivering it to districts that are property tax poor and giving that. And they do, but what's happened over the last uh, some years, uh, five, 10 years is property values across the state of Texas have risen to the point that there are way more quote unquote property rich districts than there are property poor districts. And so a lot of that money is just going back to the state treasury. Uh, so that's why when you're, when you're maintenance and operation, yes, you are paying more taxes, but the money isn't necessarily coming to the school district. Our next question goes back to the compensation discussion. And does the proposed uh, increase for staff members include bus drivers as well? Yes, it does. And so those compensation is for all staff. Uh, and of course, you know, we say from the midpoint because different staff are on different pay scales. So the, the 3% impacts everybody differently. Thank you. Um, the next question is, um, can the district use its fund balance as a rainy day fund? Uh, yes, it can. And uh, we currently, well, I shouldn't say currently, but to start the school year, we had almost $41 million in fund balance, which is very good. It's a very healthy fund balance that trustees have built up over time. So yes, our plan is to use that fund balance run deficit budgets to be able to spread out any cuts that we have to do, continue to maintain providing compensation plans for our, our staff, and then hopefully get to a point where not only are we increasing students, which will bring in revenue, but we get to a legislative session, which I hope the legislatures will see the need across the state, not just Maine or ISD, and provide us um, some new revenue. Awesome. And again, we have people kind of tuning in and tuning out. Can you explain what a fund balance is and what type of things that a fund balance goes to? So, so a fund balance is essentially, um, think of it as a savings account. Um, 
the school district, um, when we have excess revenues over expenditures, that money automatically goes into the general fund balance. And that money is serves a few purposes. And, and by the way, there's a reason you want school districts to have a fund balance. There's a really good reason. The first good reason is that impacts our, our borrowing rating. Um, so think about your credit rating. School districts have a credit rating also. So if we have a good fund balance, creditors say, we'll, we'll lend you money to build buildings at a lower rate. So that's a good thing. Uh, the other reason you have the fund balance, of course, is just what was mentioned. You, you have a rainy day fund to help spread out cuts when you need to. And so that's why we, we've maintained that fund balance. And now we're accessing that. Now, fund balances don't last forever. So when you start seeing that fund balance going down, it's time to make some changes. And that's what we're doing now. All right. Uh, well, the next question, it goes back to, to budget and budget cuts. Uh, will budget cuts impact extracurricular activities? Uh, they will. Uh, like I said, everybody is working to work together to try to find savings. Um, I don't know that extracurricular teams and groups will necessarily notice um, some of the cuts right away. Uh, some of the cuts are really in delaying um, purchase of some items to future years. Now, we're always going to buy items that are absolutely needed, especially for safety, items that are needed for um, just to be able to compete. We're going to get those things, but maybe some other items we'll push off to future years um, or whenever we have an opportunity for a different funding source. Our next question is, are there, are there any planned campaigns or initiatives to raise awareness and garner support from community and com, uh, from parents and community members? Uh, well, we're here, so here's one. Um, but, but certainly, uh, I, I'm a big believer in, in trying to inform everybody, both staff and community. I think school districts are one and the same with their community, and we all have got to be on the same page about what's happening with our schools. And so trying to make sure I get that message out there to different groups, absolutely I want to do that. Uh, right now, though, we're still in the early stages of discussing, and so we don't want to get too far out there yet. Uh, we're still working on those budget numbers, and I'm hoping to, as I begin to meet with community groups maybe over the summer to discuss this, uh, that that budget number will be a bit better. Um, but yes, absolutely. Um, and I do know I invited a few people out there. I am more than happy to come to, to your organizations as well. Um, if you'd like me to speak further on this topic or, or any topic, really. Can you, uh, the next question is, can you provide some specific examples of what budget cuts have taken place as of today? Um, let's see, specific um, bu budget cuts. Um, well, you, made, you, you just made me draw a blank right there. Uh, or so in general, like we can, I, I mean, I know you were talking about potential equipment delaying that. Um, yeah. so, so we can start with, uh, for example, we, we have some um, um, maintenance guys, you know, they do great work, but they're always driving all over and hauling stuff. Their trucks are really, really old. And at some point, you know, it, it, just like a car, if you own a car yourself, at some point, it's beginning to look like you should probably buy a new car rather than keep repairing the old car. But in situations like we're in where we want to maintain the compensation and that's the priority, we're going to try to keep those trucks going. Uh, another example is uh, we look through all our software. We're identifying duplicate systems. Um, can we use this for free um, because it's online? It may not be as nice, but it's free compared to something we might be paying for. So removing items like that. Uh, let's see, um, reducing overnight travel um, to almost nothing. We've went ahead and initiated that unless it's something that we absolutely have to be a part of. We're not doing overnight travel anymore in the district. Um, trying to focus on professional development that is um, done by our own teachers, for example, uh, that saves costs on paying for contractors and other persons to come into the district. Uh, we, we are blessed by, we live really close to what's known as the Region Service Center in Central Texas. It's just down the road on 290 and on Springdale Road. They have a lot of professional development, so accessing that rather than looking at other conferences that might be around the state. So th those are just good examples of things that we're looking at. Some of those are small, some of those are big. Um, and yeah, they all add up over time as you begin to look for each of those little things. And um, what I always remind people is if we can find a way to, to save $60,000, we just saved a teaching position. And that really is a good way of quantifying um, what, what we need to do and what we need to accomplish and why it's important, even the quote unquote smaller things. 
how does this year's budget compare to last year's budget? Well, uh, you know, the, some of the graphs showed some of those comparisons. Um, the budget, um, we're expending less. Uh, that's in the easiest way to say it. We're reducing our costs. I'm going to tell you in a moment, I'm going to tell you a little trick that the state legislature requires that makes it look not that way all the time. But we are spending less. Um, we're reducing our costs in almost every single function and area of the district. There are some places where we have no choice. Um, like I mentioned, our causality insurance is going up. So that's one area where you're going to see a bump. Um, and causality insurance is, right, we just had a big storm here, and um, I believe we actually did have some damage. So our insurance covers it, but our premiums for that have gone up. So those areas, you'll see um, some increase in that place. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, some interesting thing that the state legislator does, whenever we have to do a recapture payment, even though we're not spending it on kids, we actually have to report that as an expenditure. And when our reports come out, it shows it as an expenditure on a student, even though it's not. It's just one of those things that we don't get a choice on, um, but we have to put it in there. So just putting that out there. Thank you. Um, and how does how does state funding impact our budget? Are there any anticipated changes in state funding that we should be prepared for? I I'm I, I try to be optimistic. Um, I, I believe that all across the state, superintendents and board trustees are talking to their legislators, and, it, and it's really, it's almost universal. People are struggling in the school district, and especially if you start thinking about smaller districts, if any of you out there are from small towns, sometimes the school district is the biggest employer in town, and it's pretty impactful when they can't make ends meet in the school district. And so I'm really hopeful that when we come into the next legislative session, that the state legislator will step up and provide some funding. Um, right now, there's something um, $4.6 billion that's kind of in limbo that could be allocated to schools right now. Um, whether you're a supporter of vouchers or not, I'm not going to get into that, but that's $4.6 billion that could be spent on education that's not. And so it's not that we don't have uh, money in the state that we could be spending, it's we've got to come together and decide that public education is the place where it needs to be spent. And uh, next question is related to our, our, our growth. I know you talked a little bit in your presentation. Um, with, in, with enrollment growing, how are we adjusting our budget to ensure that all students needs are met? Yes, so you, you may recall our number two priority is, or number three priority is to ensure that we have a classroom teacher for all our scholars. And, and I, that was in there because we know we're growing. And if we're growing, we have to hire teachers. If we're going to hire teachers, we're going to have to find savings elsewhere to ensure we can keep bringing in new teachers. So absolutely, it's a priority to ensure that we have the staff um, to um, accommodate those teachers. I'm sorry, to accommodate those students that are coming in. Uh, to put that growth in perspective, um, we grew about the size of Lagos Elementary um, this past year. So if you can imagine an entire Lagos Elementary worth of students came into the districts since last June, that's what's happened. And that's a really great growth, um, and it's really great to see that families are choosing Maynard ISD rather than other options which are available. And so we are definitely going to make sure that we are prepared to receive them by having a highly qualified teacher in the classroom. And kind of going off on that, I know that it's not a submitted question, but are we anticipated to continue to see that growth in our schools? Uh, yes, we are anticipated to see the growth. Um, anybody who's who's been here at any length of time just sees the traffic increasing and increasing, sees more and more construction. Well, that we're seeing it too. And so those students are coming into our school district and we expect that to continue. Uh, and so we're, in fact, we look forward to it. Mm -hmm. And our next question is, what about changing the graduation location for the 2025 graduation class? to the high school stadiums instead of Shoreline Church? I, you know, I think any kind of cost saving is, is always worth consideration. I will say this, you know, graduation is a, is a sacred event. Um, it is a, a, a culmination of incredible amount of work, not just with teachers, but with the parents and the kids. And so whatever we choose, that is something that I will always support spending money on if people think Shoreline is the best place for us to do graduation because I think that that's worth it. Uh, nothing, you think about all my educators, you're out there, you work all year long, you work hard, 
you know, you don't always get support in the news. You don't always get support in the legislature. But when you see one of those kids that you taught walk across the stage, you know you did something. And so I, I think we need to keep that in mind um, whenever we decide what we want to do at graduation. If people are interested in doing the stadium and that becomes a thing, I'm, I'm all for it. I've, I've been at graduations and stadiums. But if people really like the, the, the venue that we're in at Shoreline, it's a great venue and think that that's where it needs to be, I'm very supportive of that. Our next question deals with technology. And um, it's in a time where technology is increasingly important to our students, what investments are we making in educational technology? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, and I should point out that when we put out the, uh, the priorities for staff and for leadership, technology was one of the lowest things on our priorities. Now that doesn't mean it's not important. That means people felt that other things were more important than technology and we've adjusted the budget accordingly. So what does that mean? Uh, we've actually, in recent times, thanks to the voters in the 2019 bond, have, have upgraded a lot of the back end infrastructure. That's the stuff you don't see, whether it's wiring, um, you may see some new cameras going in. So there's a lot of upgrades happening. Where my concern and the technology department's concern is, is when you start talking about student devices and once they start getting into life. So where we're at as far as technology goes is we're trying to fund only the things that we absolutely need to replace as far as devices go. What our hope is looking to the future, there is a way if voters in the future someday want to approve um, us using short-term bonds to pay for technology devices, that's a way of doing it without impacting the M&O budget, which pays for compensation and salaries. So it's certainly something that we talk about. It's certainly something we want to do. It's something, though, that we know that we're going to have to prioritize at a different point. How does the budget address the needs of vulnerable populations within our district, including English, English language learners and econ economically disadvantaged students? Yes, I, I think you can look at it in, in two different ways. Uh, again, our priority was always to retain our teachers and ensure there is a teacher in the classroom. So that's the first way. Um, the first line of defense is always your teacher working um, with your students and having a highly qualified teacher. I uh, used to have a, a professor, one of the best teachers I ever had, I was a professor. She used to always tell me, Robert, the program is the teacher. That is what you work with. You can't buy anything else that's going to do what a teacher can do. And so I always keep that in mind when we start talking about uh, taking care of our vulnerable populations. Uh, the other way in, in support, though, too, is ensuring that our, our, our parent support specialists and the whole child are also fully funded because we do know that there are some needs within this district um, and within our community that we have just got to fill or those students are not going to be able to access the education that they so duly need and deserve. So in those two ways, we're definitely staying focused on those vulnerable populations. Thank you. Uh, next question also relates to meeting students' needs. Um, what what bu budgetary provisions are being made to support students' mental health needs? Right. So currently, we have um, our whole ch the whole child, and we have that staff um, there. There was no, there, we did not reduce the staffing because we do know that there are mental health needs. We also go go into this budget season knowing that we lost the office of the governor grant, which funded CIS, and CIS provided some of those supports as well. So one of the things that we're proposing in the tax rate election, and we're going to go ahead and kind of get a running start with it no matter what, is to hire some in-house, um, more in-house social workers and clinical psychologists who can provide therapy to students, both what they call acute care, which is in the moment when the crisis is unfolding, but also wraparound services and case management for students and their families for longer term care and support. Um, so those those supports are absolutely in place um, in the plans for the 24, 25 and future budgets for sure. So this one, this question also falls in line with mental health support. Um, you mentioned mental health support for staff. What would that look like in service? What would that look like in services for staff? Is that a district social worker providing support for staff or an outside agency providing support? Uh, it actually could be both. Uh, the you if you if you look at your benefits um you have a number of benefits there both with your health insurance to see a health care provider mental health provider but there's also telehealth which you can actually access someone um, just by phone if you need to so that's included in all employees benefits and those are all outside sources but when you increase the number of persons that are um are 
or who are licensed to provide clinical care and therapy, we actually increase the number of people who not only can help students, which is why we're, we're hiring them, but those persons are perfectly qualified to provide support to staff members in an acute crisis. Um, and, you know, let's face it, some things happen. Um, recently, we had someone who had a death in their family that was very near and dear, and that really caused them problems right here at work, and we want to do something. And those are the people we call on who can provide that immediate care um, for mental support and then help guide them to what is the proper care they need long term. So both, I guess, is the easy way to answer that. Thank you. So this next question goes back to fund balance. And the question is, is can can trustees uh, decide what we do with fund balance? Yes, absolutely. And, and in fact, they do. Um, so fund balance is taken into account whenever you um, adopt the budget. So if we are adopting a deficit budget, we're knowing that we're going to draw some amount down from the fund balance, most likely to cover that deficit. And so that's that's the main way it gets spent. Now, theoretically, I don't recommend our trustees do this right now, but you could theoretically take um, X amount of dollars and buy a one-time cost, for example. Um, so if you wanted to buy a school bus, we could just take money out and buy a school bus if, if the trustees so desired. Um, but uh, generally, that's not usually how fund balance is used. Got it. Our next question, um, I know we're, we're a few minutes away um, from 7 p.m., and so just want to ask, um, looking ahead, what are the long-term financial challenges that Maynard ISD anticipates? How is the district planning to address these challenges? Um, so the, the main important thing is staying um, true to the principles and priorities that we've laid out and what we've heard from our staff and, uh, and maintaining the vision that our trustees have set for us and improving our student outcomes. And so that means really supporting um, the campus staff and those people who support the campus staff. So we will continue to focus on the compensation plan and ensuring we have teachers uh, for all our students. So how do you do that when you're in an environment where we started off with a $24 million deficit, now we're down to $17 million deficit, that's not sustainable. So you've got to continue to look for ways we can reduce costs. And luckily, because trustees have maintained that fund balance, you've got to do it over time. So as we continue to reduce costs, the idea is if we get more students, that increases revenue. If the state legislature comes in and increases revenue, eventually those two lines meet and you begin to have a balanced budget, which is what the ultimate goal is. That's not going to happen next year. It's probably not going to happen two years from now. We're hoping it's going to happen in year three. And um, that's what we're aiming for. Thank you, Dr. Sermani. So we're about a minute away. So um, that was our last question for the evening, but I want to give you an opportunity, Dr. Sermani, to close it out. Is there anything else that you'd like our main ISD community to know about the budget considerations and the challenges we face and the financial future of our district? I, I think the most important thing here is as, as sometimes people hear budget and they get all doom or gloom. And I'm going to tell you what, uh, the future of Maynard ISD is bright. I, you, I was telling the principals the other day, you think about how far we've come in just reducing the budget over the 23-24 school year. And even with that, you look at all the accomplishments that have taken place everywhere from 79 students who are graduating with associate's degree, being a Texas Art Educator Association, a district of distinction again, having students compete at the state level in UIL film, um, we had a soccer team that went far deep into areas. Uh, so, so even with these cuts, we can still accomplish what we want. And, and that all has to do with the support we have from our community, the support we have from our children, the support we have from our staff. As long as we continue to be a team, we're going to be okay. And actually, forget that. We're not going to be okay. We're going to be great. Um, and it is possible. So um, since a lot of the people out there are community members, I, I just want to say this, um, since I have this opportunity, I truly believe that school districts and community are, are one and the same. We are a reflection of the community, and we should be a reflection of the community, and we shall always be a reflection of the community. And it is in partnership with our community is how we deal with um, issues like we have today with our budget. And together, we can accomplish anything um, once we come together. So. Um, with that, uh, I just, I know this guy will probably will close us out, but I just want to say thank you to everyone who uh, took the time to listen to me. Um, uh, hopefully I wasn't too boring. Um, hopefully there weren't too many numbers, um, but certainly I appreciate everybody who um, tuned in tonight. 
Just echoing what Dr. Sermani said, thank you for being here with us tonight. There's a lot of things that you could do, but we're glad that you spent your evening with us learning a little bit more about the budget and how it impacts our students and our staff. Um, as a reminder, if you didn't get your question answered tonight, or if you have more questions, please feel free to reach out to us at info at mainerisd.net. Shoot us an email. We're happy to get that response to you. And then also, if you want to watch this again, or if you want to share it with somebody, a recording of this will be available on our YouTube channel and on our social media pages in the coming days. So again, thank you, and I hope you all have a lovely evening.